This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we discuss the year in music for 2009, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2009. We also look at the case for putting Interpol into next year's class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Plus, our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Irish Rock and Roll Museum and Hall of Fame in Dublin, Ireland. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2009. In music, the major story of the year was the death of Michael Jackson. BET Television did a tribute to him, which was passable at best during their award ceremony. That was overshadowed earlier in the day when Michael's father, Joe, didn't even talk about his son during interviews on the red carpet, but rather decided to push his own music project with another group. Ah, you gotta love family sometimes. It's so wonderful. Yeah. Anywho, the MTV Video Music Awards also paid him a tribute with a performance by his sister Janet Jackson and a speech by Madonna, who was a friend of his. But even that was overshadowed by the now infamous Kanye West interrupting Taylor Swift's speech incident. I'm going to let you finish, but goodness. Meanwhile, in 2009, Chris Brown was charged with assaulting Rihanna the night before the Grammy Awards. The Concert Husset Concert Hall opened in Copenhagen, Denmark. The inauguration of President Barack Obama drew star-studded power to inauguration concerts and balls, including Beyonce, who, according to the media, got into a little trouble with singer Etta James because Etta didn't like the fact that Beyonce performed Etta's classic song At Last as the first dance song for the President and First Lady Michelle Obama. No one was quite sure what the beef was really about, or, since it was reported in the media, whether Etta was really even angry. But, as you will see later, beef was kind of the word of the year, and it wasn't just Kanye versus Taylor or Beyonce versus Etta. The biggest album of the year in America was Taylor Swift's Fearless. The biggest album of the year worldwide, however, was Britain's Got Talent contestant Susan Boyle. Other big albums were released by U2, Lady Gaga, Eminem, Michael Buble, Andrea Bocelli, Jay-Z, The Black Eyed Peas, The Kings of Leon, the Hannah Montana movie soundtrack, and three of Michael Jackson's albums because death is always a great career move. You're just not around to enjoy the benefits. In fact, even though he didn't have the biggest selling album of the year, Michael was still the biggest selling artist of the year, selling 35 million copies of his catalog albums worldwide right after his death, along with his documentary, This Is It, becoming the biggest documentary of all time up to that point, making over $250 million. 2009 was also Lady Gaga's coming out party with three of the biggest hits of the year being Just Dance, Telephone, and Poker Face. The Black Eyed Peas also had a big year with Boom Boom Pow and I Got a Feeling. Other best-selling singles of 2009 included Beyonce's Single Ladies, Taylor Swift's Love Story, and also You Belong With Me, Flo Rida's Right Round, Jason Mraz's I'm Yours, Kanye's Heartless, which he definitely was, and the All-American Rejects Give You Hell, which Kanye did. In country music, Garth Brooks came out of his self-imposed exile to start a five-year Las Vegas residency. Big albums were also released in country music by Brad Paisley, Miranda Lambert, Martina McBride, Tim McGraw, Carrie Underwood, Toby Keith, Keith Urban, the Hannah Montana movie soundtrack, and two greatest hits albums from Kenny Chesney and Brooks and Dunn. 
Having big hit singles in country music in 2009 were Taylor Swift's You Belong With Me, Sugar Land's Already Gone, Lady Antebellum, now known as Lady A, with their hit I Run To You, Kenny Chesney's Out Last Night, Toby Keith's God Lover, Darius Rucker's It Won't Be Like This For Long, Jason Aldean's Big Green Tractor, Alan Jackson's Country Boy, Carrie Underwood's Cowboy Casanova, Rascal Flatts's Here Comes Goodbye, George Strait's River of Love, Blake Shelton's She Wouldn't Be Gone, Keith Urban's Only You Could Love Me This Way, and the Zac Brown Band's Toes. In hip-hop, it was the year of beef as 50 Cent and Rick Ross Benny Siegel and 50 Cent versus Jay-Z, Method Man and Joe Budden, and Young Jeezy and DJ Drama, Trina and Kia, and Soldier Boy and Bow Wow all decided to go at it with each other because no one learned from the Tupac Biggie beef. For instance, Joe Budden was physically attacked by Method Man's fellow Wu-Tang Clan member Raekwon a few months after this whole beef between those guys started. Bunch of morons. Ending beef, thankfully, that year were The Game and 50 Cent, while Soldier Boy tried to end his beef with The New Boys. Musically, Drake released his mixtape So Far Gone, which had Best I Ever Had on it. Eminem's Crack a Bottle and Flo Rider's Right and Round both hit number one, but the biggest and probably most enduring hip-hop song from 2009 was Jay-Z and Alicia Keys' New York City anthem, Empire State of Mind. Other hits were Jay-Z and Rihanna's Run This Town, Fabulous's Throat in the Bag, Kanye's Heartless, Lil Wayne's Prop Queen, T.I.'s Dead and Gone, and Kid Cudi's Day and Night. Big albums that year were released by Eminem, Jay-Z, 50 Cent, Rick Ross, Young Money, Jada Kiss, Kid Cudi, Fabulous, Gucci Mane, and UGK. EDM started to become more mainstream, mainly due to David Guetta helping to produce the Black Eyed Peas album and his song with Kelly Rowland, When Love Takes Over, making way for other artists to want to work with EDM producers, which all led to the EDM explosion only a couple of years later. Big EDM albums included Dead Mouses, for lack of a better name, Major Lazer's Guns Don't Kill People, Lasers Do, the Prodigy's Invaders Must Die, Calvin Harris's Ready for the Weekend, and Moby's Wait for Me. Other dance hits besides the Black Eyed Peas's I Got a Feeling and Boom Boom Pow were Cascade's Move for Me, Dizzy Rascal's Dirty Cash, LaRoe's Bulletproof, Axwell and Ingrosso's Leave the World Behind, Dead Mouse's EDM classic Ghosts and Stuff, Cascada's Evacuate the Dance Floor, Fetty Legrand's influential dance track, Put Your Hands Up for Detroit. I love this city. David Guetta's Memories, along with Sexy Bitch, his song with Akon. Boys Noises' Jeffer. Christine W.'s Be All Right. While Lady Gaga owned the dance floor with the three aforementioned hits from a couple minutes ago. The top 10 DJs on DJ Mag's Top 100 DJs poll for the year were Armin Van Buren, Tiesto, David Guetta, Above and Beyond, Paul Van Dyke, Dead Mouse, Ferry Corsten, Marcus Schultz, Gareth Emery, and Sander Van Dorn. In Latin music, the biggest artists of the year included Aventura, who also had the biggest album of the year, Banda El Ricodo, who had the biggest single of the year, Wizen E. Yandel, Luis Fonzi, Vicente Fernandez, Daddy Yankee, El Trono de Mexico, Nesti, Ricardo Orjonio, and Tito El Bambino. On May 12, 2009, at a White House event celebrating poetry, Lin-Manuel Miranda tried out an idea that he had by rapping about Alexander Hamilton. The response that he received that year inspired him to flesh out his idea some more, and that idea became the blockbuster Broadway sensation Hamilton, which came to Broadway in 2015, but was started out as an idea six years earlier in 2009. 
Meanwhile, on Broadway for 2009, that Broadway season, 2009 to 2010, was the first season that the total box office grossed over $1 billion U.S. Musicals or revivals that opened in 2009 included 9 to 5, the musical, Bye Bye Birdie, Fella for Fella Kuti, Guys and Dolls, Irving Berlin's White Christmas, Hair, Memphis the Musical, Rock of Ages, and West Side Story. Musical films of 2009 included Hannah Montana the Movie, Nine, and Notorious, along with animated film Alvin and the Chipmunks the Squeakquel. Bands who formed in 2009 included Alabama Shakes, A Wall Nation, Basement, Diddy Dirty Money, Duck Sauce, Foster the People, Icona Pop, 21 Pilots, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, Nick Jonas and the Organization, and Zed's Dead. Bands that broke up in 2009 before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included All Saints, Love and Rockets, Live, Blue Cheer, Danity Kane, Divinals, EMF, Oasis, after yet more beef between the Gallagher brothers. See, beef was in the making for the entire year, no matter the genre. Also, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Fall Out Boy, The Pussycat Dolls, Hanoi Rocks, The Verve, Violent Femmes, Stereolab, and Escape. Bands that either reunited or came back from extended breaks included the Bee Gees, Blink-182, who seemed to go on and off almost every other year, Cinderella, Creed, Capone and Noriega, The Cranberries, Faith No More, House of Pain, Johnny Hates Jazz, Limp Biscuit, Method Man and Red Man, Mata Hoople, Mr. Big, Fish, The Plastic Ono Band, Public Image Limited, Skunk Anansi, Spandau Ballet, Wang Chung, Sublime, and The Jacksons. Aside from Michael Jackson, other major music deaths included guitarist Ron Ashton of the Stooges, guitar great Mr. Les Paul, also EDM DJ, DJ AM, Billy Powell of Leonard Skinner, singer Dan Seals, former basketball player and jazz man Wayman Tisdale, blues great Coco Taylor, singer Al Martino, Avenge Sevenfold founder The Rev, singer Vic Chestnut, singer Carla Boney, singer Stephen Gately of the group Boyzone, singer Taylor Mitchell, singer Mercedes Sosa, DJ Rock Rada, singers Willie DeVille, drummer Uriel Jones of Motown's house band The Funk Brothers, Randy Kane of The Delphonics, Bob Bogle of The Ventures, rapper Dalla, Steve Ferguson of NRBQ, opera singer She Pay Poo, the father of Latin Boogaloo, Joe Cuba, singer Vern Gosden, composer Maurice Jarre, singer Alan Bushung, singer Hank Lachlan, Lux Interior of The Cramps, Dewey Martin of Buffalo Springfield, and Mary Travers of Peter, Paul, and Mary. In awards for the music of 2009, at the Grammy Awards, Taylor Swift's Fearless won Album of the Year, making her, at the age of 20, the youngest winner of the award until Billie Eilish took care of that a decade later and broke the record. Record of the Year went to Kings of Leon's Use Somebody, Beyonce won Song of the Year for Single Ladies, and the Zac Brown Band won Best New Artist. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Beyonce won Video of the Year for Single Ladies, although, as mentioned before, Kanye stole the show and not in a good way. At the American Music Awards, Taylor Swift won Artist of the Year. Beyonce won Album of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. The Billboard Music Awards weren't held that year, actually. And Lady Gaga's Born This Way won Favorite Album, and Katy Perry and Kanye's song E.T. won Favorite Song at the People's Choice Awards. Taylor Swift won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards and also won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Florence and the Machine won Best British Album for Lungs, and JLS won Best Song for Beat Again at the Brit Awards. During that ceremony, Iron Maiden became the first heavy metal act to win a Brit Award when they won the Best Live Act Award. 
Kanan won Artist of the Year. Michael Bublé's Crazy Love won Best Album, while Michael's song, Haven't Met You Yet, won Best Song at the Juno Awards. Empire of the Sun won Album of the Year for Walking on a Dream, and they also won Song of the Year for Walking on a Dream at the ARIA Music Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Moscow, Russia, Alexander Ryback from Norway won for the song Fairy Tale. At the Tony Awards, Billy Elliot, the musical, won Best Musical, and Hair won Best Revival of a Musical. Steve Reich's piece, Double Sextet, won the Pulitzer Prize for Music. For Academy Awards music categories, the soundtrack to the movie Up won Best Film Score, and The Weary Kind from the movie Crazy Heart won Best Song. Speech to Bill won the Mercury Music Prize, becoming the first woman in seven years to win that award. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony took place on April 4th in Cleveland, Ohio, which was the first time in 12 years that it had taken place in Cleveland. It was held at the public auditorium there. It was also the first time that the public were allowed to buy tickets to the event. At the ceremony, Bass guitarist Bill Black, drummer DJ Fontana, and keyboardist Spooner Oldham were inducted into the Sidemen category. That was also the final year of the Sidemen category, as the category was expanded upon in 2010 and became the Artist for Musical Excellence category. In the Early Influencers category that year, the Hall inducted Wanda Jackson. In the Performers category... The Hall inducted Metallica, Bobby Womack, Little Anthony and the Imperials, Run DMC, and this next artist. Jeffrey Arnold Beck was born on June 24, 1944 in Surrey, England. Beck's fascination with the electric guitar started early in his life, although his mom wanted him to pursue piano. It was his determination and fascination with the guitar that would propel him to become one of the most influential and respected guitarists of all time. Beck's early years were steeped in music. Inspired by the likes of Les Paul, he honed his skills, eventually joining his first band, The Bandits, at the age of 16. A series of local bands followed, including the Deltones and the Tridents, where Beck began experimenting with effects pedals and crafting his signature sound. A crucial turning point came in 1963 when Ian Stewart, the pianist for the Rolling Stones at the time, introduced Jeff to the blues. This exposure, particularly to the works of Mr. Buddy Guy, profoundly influenced Beck's playing, adding raw emotion and expressive power to his playing style. In 1965, Beck's career took off when he was chosen to replace Eric Clapton as lead guitarist in the group The Yardbirds. This legendary band, known for their blues rock sound, was already pushing boundaries. Beck's arrival further ignited their creative fire with songs like Shapes of Things and Over, Under, Sideways, Down, they showcased his technical prowess and his love of feedback and distortion, two elements that would soon become trademarks to his style. Despite the band's commercial success and critical acclaim, Beck's needs for artistic exploration led him to leave the Yardbirds in 1966, This period also saw Beck's first solo foray with the single Hi-Ho Silver Lining, a pop experiment that foreshadowed his future genre-bending tendencies. Following his departure from the Yardbirds, Beck formed the Jeff Beck Group, a band that became a launchpad for some of rock's most iconic figures. With vocalist Rod Stewart, bassist Ron Wood, later of the Rolling Stones, as a guitarist, no less, and drummer Mickey Waller, the group created a sound that fused blues rock with heavy metal and psychedelic music. 
Albums like Truth and Beckola showcase their raw energy and Beck's virtuosity with tracks like Beck's Bolero and Shape of Things becoming staples of classic rock radio. The group also witnessed the arrival of another future legend, vocalist Ronnie Montrose, who later formed his group Montrose. However, Internal tensions and a near-fatal car accident involving Beck led to the group breaking up in 1972. Undeterred, Jeff formed another power trio with bassist Tim Bogert and drummer Carmine Apice, formerly of the group Vanilla Fudge. Beck, Bogert, and Apice delivered a heavier, more hard rock sound on albums like Beck, Bogert, and Apice and Live in Japan. Their music explored complex time signatures and showcased Beck's ability to blend blues-inspired licks with blazing technical passages. And despite the critical acclaim, the band faced commercial challenges and broke up in 1974. Following the breakup of Beck, Bogart, and the Peace, Jeff Beck embarked on his own solo career that defied categorization. He, for instance, embraced a more instrumental approach this time around, showcasing his virtuosity across various genres. Albums like Blow by Blow and Wired incorporated elements of jazz fusion, funk, and world music, featuring collaborations with keyboardists such as Jan Hammer and Tony Hymas. Songs like Cause We Ended as Lovers and Escape became classic radio anthems, demonstrating Beck's ability to blend technical mastery with melodic beauty. The 1980s saw a shift in Beck's career, with him continuing to explore diverse musical styles. Beck embraced the rise of synthesizers and electronic music which is evident in his albums like There and Back in 1980 and Flash in 1985, which also happens to be my favorite Jeff Beck album. He also experimented with a finger-picking technique, abandoning the guitar pick altogether. This new approach yielded a more nuanced and expressive sound on albums like Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop, which he put out in 1989. Never one to shy away from collaboration, Beck lent his talents to a diverse group of musicians, which was something that he had actually done since the 1970s when he played on Stevie Wonder's Talking Book album, including an uncredited guitar part on the song Superstition. He also continued working with Rod Stewart, showing up on Rod's song Infactuation for Rod's 1984 album Camouflage and a cover version of the Curtis Mayfield penned Persuasion's recorded song People Get Ready for Jeff's 1985 album Flash, which again is my favorite Jeff Beck album. In the 1990s, Jeff continued to defy categorization, incorporating elements of world music, particularly Indian influences, into his works. Albums like Amused to Death in 1993 and Who Else in 1999 showcased his willingness to push boundaries. Notably, the album Who Else featured a haunting cover of The Ballad of Lucy Jordan by Marion Faithful which showcased Beck's ability to turn classic songs into his own with his own unique style. The 21st century brought renewed energy for Jeff Beck. He reconnected with his blues roots on albums like You Had It Coming in 2000 and Emotion and Commotion in 2007. The latter album, featuring vocalist Imogene Heap, garnered critical acclaim and earned him his first Grammy Award, finally, for Best Pop Instrumental Performance. Beck continued his collaborative spirit, working with artists like Josh Stone on the 2010 album Let It Bleed and Herbie Hancock on the 2010 album Recordings. These collaborations showcase his versatility and ability to seamlessly integrate his playing into very different musical contexts. The final decade of Beck's life was marked by continued artistic exploration and a focus on instrumental music. 
He released albums like Loud Hailer in 2016 and Cop Car in 2018, featuring a blend of rock, blues, and electronica. Notably, Loud Hailer featured a blistering cover of The Wolf Will Bite Your Ass by the group The Germs, demonstrating Beck's ability to revitalize punk energy through his playing. In 2022, Jeff Beck surprised fans with a collaboration with actor Johnny Depp. Their album, entitled 18, featured a collection of mostly cover songs showcasing their shared love of blues and rock music. And despite mixed critical acclaim, the album highlighted Beck's ability to connect with musicians across generations. Jeff continued to work almost right up to his death from a bacterial meningitis infection on January 10th, 2023, at the age of 78. As a solo artist, Jeff Beck released 17 studio albums, 11 live albums, and three compilation albums. Of those, 10 hit the top 40 in America, with only 1975's album Blow by Blow getting into the top 10, topping out at number four. He also released 22 singles, although they really didn't chart in America. My personal favorite song of his, by the way, will forever be the song Ambitious, which is off of my favorite album of his, again, 1985's Flash. I highly suggest you check that album specifically out. It's a masterpiece. Jeff Beck also won eight out of 17 Grammy Award nominations. His influence on guitar playing is undeniable. His innovative techniques, such as that finger-picking style that we talked about earlier, along with his use of feedback, continue to inspire guitarists worldwide. In his ability to seamlessly blend genres and collaborate with diverse artists across all types of music broadened the landscape of rock music forever. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1992 originally as a member of the group The Yardbirds. In 2009, fellow Yardbirds bandmate and two-time Hall of Famer himself, Jimmy Page, presented Jeff for his solo induction. Presented for induction by Jimmy Page of Hall of Fame inductees The Yardbirds and Led Zeppelin, Mr. Jeff Beck, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2009, and we have put a selection of his music, including my all-time favorite album, like I've said numerous times, 1985's Flash. On to this week's music podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History in Depth podcast where we go more in depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History in Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. For the past few weeks, we have been looking at artists who are eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction in their first year of eligibility for this upcoming year, which would be the class of 2025. This week, we are going to take a look at a post-punk revival group that was formed at New York University and whose first EP was independently released in 2000 by a Scottish record label, And that is why they're eligible for the Hall in 2025, even though Matador Records didn't sign them until 2002, which would normally mean that they wouldn't be eligible until 2027, and Capitol Records didn't sign them to their first major label contract until 2006. I am referring to the Indie Darlings Interpol. So, with all that said, 
as usual, to the tail of the tape we go. Interpol have released seven studio albums and seven EPs. Of those, six hit the top 40 in America, with four of those six going to the top 10 in the UK. Seven hit the top 40, with six of those seven hitting the top 10. Interpol have also released 32 singles and promotional singles, and of those, six hit the top 40 in America with none of them hitting the top 10, although 2007's The Heinrich Maneuver got to number 11. In the UK, five hit the top 40 with only The Heinrich Maneuver hitting the top 10, cresting at number 5. Interpol have sold over 2 million copies worldwide, with 1.4 million of those in America alone. They have a fervent, and I do mean fervent, fan base, which was built on years of touring, although some people are now accusing them of using backing tracks when they perform, which is kind of sad. They are also known for being critical darlings, with a lot of their work making annual best of the year lists. Interpol have been considered the kings of the New York City indie rock scene, whose sound gets compared to Joy Division, Television, and Echo and the Bunnymen. Their 2002 album, Turn On the Bright Lights, is considered one of the most influential post-punk revival albums of the early 2000s, and they are considered one of the most influential groups to every post-punk group in the 21st century. Also, they're still around, which is more than you can say for a lot of the groups from the past couple of decades. Will they be inducted into the hall in 2025? Yeah, I tend to doubt it. Will they be eventually? I'm going to go long on this one and say that it's going to take them at least a decade before people consider them for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Normally, I would say, yeah, they stand a chance, but because of the fact that there are a lot of other groups out there that are better known, those groups will probably get in before Interpol does. Do they deserve to be in? Absolutely. They 100% deserve to eventually be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, just not quite too quickly. But we'll let you be the judge because we have put their music onto this week's podcast playlist as well. And like I said before, the link is in the show notes. Normally, we cover music halls of fame and museums in America. This week, however, we're going across the pond, as they say, to the good old Emerald Isle. The Irish Rock and Roll Museum was opened in 2015. It's located in the venue The Button Factory, which is on Curved Street in the Temple Bar District in the heart of Dublin, Ireland. Temple Lane Rehearsal Space and Temple Lane Recording Studios are also part of that complex. The museum gives tours of the venues and also has memorabilia and a wall of fame. There's also a wax museum as part of a package deal if you ever want to go that route. The museum is normally open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., but as of this recording, the museum is open for private tours. Adults are normally 16.5 euros, with seniors and students at 14.5 euros, whatever that works out to be in American money. As always, with museums these days, check with the museum's website at irishrockandrollmuseum.com to see if and when they are open or when they do private tours before planning your trip. We will, of course, put that link in the description in the show notes. In 1985, Prince was in an extremely creative zone. Not only was he riding high off of the success of Purple Rain, he was working on his next album, Around the World in a Day, along with material for the next official album after that called Parade, a solo album as an alter ego named Camille, and an album with his band The Revolution called Dream Factory. Both Dream Factory and Camille would be reworked into Prince's album Sign of the Times and also Crystal Ball, which was released after his untimely death in 2016 by his estate. 
While Prince was doing all of that, he was also producing and doing side projects with other bands. One of those side projects was with a group called The Family. They released one album called The Family because, as we all know by now, you cannot officially be considered a recording act until you name an album after yourself. Anyway, there was one song on that album that Prince wrote that, much like the album that it came from, received very little attention, at least not from the public. As it turns out, though, one artist did notice the song and wrote it to international superstardom. Sinead O'Connor was born on December 8, 1966 in Dublin, Ireland as the third of five children. Sinead released her critically hailed debut album, The Lion and the Cobra, in 1988, which, to be honest, is my absolute favorite album of hers. That album had some cult hits on it, like Lay Your Hands on Me, Troy, and Mandinga, which earned her a Best Female Rock Vocal Performance Grammy nomination that year. In 1989, Shania got to work on her sophomore album, and as she was working on material for the album, she came across the family's version of Prince's song. The song about loss struck a chord in Shania that reminded her of the loss of her mother, whom she said abused her as a child, but who was killed in a car accident in 1985 before Shanae had made a name for herself. Shanae had recorded the 5 minute 10 second power ballad version of the song, Nothing Compares to You, with her producer, Nellie Hooper. Her record label, Chrysalis, put it on her new album, I Do Not Want What I Have Not Got, and released the song on January 8, 1990. The John Maybury-directed music video for the song had just a single camera trained on her face with an all-black background, with a couple of cuts of Sinead walking through the Parc de Saint Cloud in Paris, France, thrown in for a few seconds. The parts where she's crying while singing were actually real. She shed real tears for the video. They were not computer generated. Both the single and the music video were international smash hits. The single went top five in 20 different countries, 18 of them number one, including America, while the album that it came from topped the charts as well. Critically, the song was huge with extremely good reviews. Sinead was lauded for her vocal skills in the song, going from anger to a whisper and back again over and over again, and not even missing a beat while doing it. When you hear her singing that song, you would swear that she was the one who wrote it because you believe she's feeling every single thing that she's singing in real time. Sinead's version of the song has also made a ton of different greatest songs of the 90s and also greatest songs of all time lists. The single went on to be nominated for a ton of awards, including a few Grammy Awards, while the music video cleaned house at that year's MTV Video Music Awards, winning Best Female Video, Best Postmodern Video, and Video of the Year, making Sinead the first female artist to take home the coveted Video of the Year prize. In 1993, Prince would release his own recording of the song, but as beautiful as his version is, Shania just nailed it better. And it's one of those few times that a cover version of a song is actually better than the original. However, Nothing Compares to You and Purple Rain were the two songs most used when Prince would tragically pass away in 2016. In fact, there was a worldwide radio simulcast of Shanae's version of Nothing Compares to You exactly 15 days and 7 hours after Prince passed away in honor of the lyric that starts off the song, quote, it's been 7 hours and 15 days since you took your love away, end quote. In short, it's an extremely well-written song, as you would expect Prince to have written, along with being one of the most emotional, gut-punching vocal performances of the last 50 years, masterfully sung by Sinead O'Connor. 
Every generation needs that artist who pushes the buttons and agitates in order for some conversations to start up. Sinead was definitely one of those artists for Generation X. In fact, she was a wrecking ball. But it was her cost for having strong opinions and having a voice to say them. She gladly paid that price. In order to understand her impact, you really have to remember the times and the place that she came from. Ultra-conservatism was huge in the Western world in the 1980s, and even into the late 1990s, you might say. Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush were the presidents in that era. The moral majority Christian conservatives were in control of the media and government in America. In the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher and John Major were the prime ministers during that era. In Ireland, you had the battles and the bloodshed between the Catholics and the Protestants and also the power of the Catholic Church. The Irish part is what molded Sinead. The American part is what almost crushed her career completely, or rather, as she puts it, the career her record label wanted her to have. After the success of both the song and the album, Sinead became one of the more than a few artists who bit the hand that fed her and rightfully railed against the music industry, famously boycotting the Grammy Awards in 1991 at the height of her popularity. She boycotted a performance on Saturday Night Live when it was announced that the guest host that night was shock comedian Andrew Dice Clay, who was known at the time for making let's just say, not-so-nice jokes about women. She said that she would not play in a stadium that played the American National Anthem before her concert, which got Frank Sinatra so angry that he said during his own performance that he would, quote, kick her ass, end quote. She took on abuse by the Catholic Church by ripping up a photo of the Pope during a performance on Saturday Night Live on October 3, 1992, and then screamed, quote, fight the real enemy, end quote, which got her into a ton of trouble and derailed her career for a time in America. And by time, I mean eh, at least a couple decades. During the next week's performance on Saturday Night Live, guest host Joe Pesci held up the retaped photo of the Pope and said that if he were the host that night, he would have hit her, to which the audience applauded loudly because I guess hitting women is good? Uh, you know, sometimes you just kind of wonder. <sighs> People. Anyway... Even famous church agitator Madonna went after Sinead for doing what she did, though most people pointed out Madonna's hypocrisy and also her own personal history and figured that Madonna just needed some extra publicity for the sex photo book she was selling at the time. A few weeks after that, Sinead was booed mightily at a Bob Dylan tribute concert. On stage, fellow performer Chris Christofferson kept her close to him, protecting her from the crowd, gave her a hug, and said to her, quote, Don't let the bastards get you down. End quote. Funny thing was, through all of this, Shania was actually years ahead of her time in protesting the sexual abuses of the Catholic Church as the accusations of sexual abuse by priests, along with the cover-up by the Catholic Church, would start to become news in the media and in the court systems worldwide about a decade or so later. Then there was Shania's search for meaning in her life through different religions. She was ordained as a minister in the Latin Trinidine Church, which is a denomination of the Catholic Church that is not under the Pope's control, or at least wasn't at that point in 1999. She converted to Islam in 2018. As people have aptly pointed out, she had her struggles with mental health issues for decades, including being hospitalized after sending out tweets where she had talked about killing herself. She had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Her son Shane, whom she lost custody of when he was 13 to Shane's father due to her mental health issues, committed suicide in early 2022. 
Throughout all of this, Shanae had put out nine more albums after the success of I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got. And while she did not have the same success in America that that album did, her other albums did garner a bunch of various award nominations. In 2021, she released her memoirs and announced her retirement from the music industry. There was recent talk in 2023 that she was working on a new album and that was going to be put out in 2024 and that a tour would soon follow. However, on July 26th, 2023, Shanae had passed away from natural causes in London, England at the age of 56. In death, there have been the usual tributes from celebrities, some of whom knew her and most who didn't, but act, of course, like they did because they saw her at an event here or there. I guess that counts as friendship in celebrity circles. Only the few people who she called friends were really there for her when she needed them. Others either made fun of her issues while she was alive or or talk down to her when she would offer advice to not sexualize themselves for the music industry, which was the advice that she gave to Miley Cyrus when Miley was going through that phase in her career, to which Miley attacked Sinead and told her to seek help. Sinead also said wild things about celebrities sometimes during her many mental health episodes, such as accusing Arsenio Hall and Eddie Murphy of giving Prince the painkillers that eventually killed him. Still, in an era where no one stood up for anything or only pushed buttons because it either got them attention or a payday, much like today's era of influencers and reality show stars, Shanaid stood up for what she felt was right and stood against what she felt was wrong, regardless of the personal or professional cost. She spoke out about racism, especially in the music industry, sexual abuse, a woman's right to choose, the events in Northern Ireland at the time, and human rights. And she never backed down from anything or anyone unless she felt that she might have aimed her weapon of choice at the wrong person, which did happen sometimes, she did end up apologizing to Arsenio Hall and Eddie Murphy. She was also open and honest about everything in her life, including her own fallacies. Even her signature shaved head was partially an act of rebellion, since her record label wanted her to grow her hair long to make her, in their words, more feminine in the eyes of the public. Shania wasn't about sexualizing herself for her fans. She let her music do the talking for her because Lord knows she left it all out there in her music for anyone and everyone to see and hear. In short, Shania O'Connor was a badass. The world could use more people like Sinead, who were genuine as opposed to manufactured for publicity's sake. Unfortunately, her like rarely ever walk the face of the earth. The Irish native and one of Ireland's most beloved singers, the late great extremely talented, extremely controversial Miss Sinead O'Connor who is in the Irish Rock and Roll Museum on their Wall of Fame in Dublin, Ireland. And we have put a selection of her music also onto this week's podcast playlist. The link, as I always say, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.